Where, where are, are you from? from? <laughs> no. Where are you really from? For my performance, Improvising Counter Hegemonies, a lived manifesto at the University of Las Vegas's Ingenians Creatives, a creativity think tank and anti conference conference, I explored. What happens when socialized norms are so deeply ingrained in us? How does the construction of desire and manufactured consent render our imaginations impotent, our capacity to think, to breathe, dream, and to act in the face of climate chaos so profoundly distorted by normative hierarchies in which we are complicit with ecological devastation? I offered an invitation to challenge our global meta crises, interlocking oppressive systems. My intention was to activate our potential for a climate resilient cultural paradigm transformation. During my performance workshop, Climate Manifesto, I lectured and danced in two contradictory costumes. The first is a fiber shed, multi species. Communally created wool outfit composed of multiple animal fibers, yak, sheep, llama, goat. For this bioregional collaboration involving over 30 fiber shed community members, typewritten using a 1950s typewriter, locally handmade hemp paper tags hung from each patch of woven fiber, indicating the species and breed of animal, the farmer, spinner, weaver, or knitter, including sheep horns as buttons. The second counter hegemony's climate costume is a VCR VHS tape ribbon woven dress, inspired by the artist's loom woven cassette tape outfits. Through her grief and resiliency, the fiber artist used waste, quote unquote, materials that are lethal to our soil and water. The VHS ribbons are made from mylar that is coated with toxic metals, allowing the tape to carry a magnetic signal, allowing the tape to tell stories. In a variety of projected images, I danced those woven stories, exposing their fertile contradictions. Through music and film, this biohazardous VHS mylar material connects us and expresses some of our most intimate storytelling. Multiple stories told through pop culture movies, cross-cultural and nature documentaries, and self-help videos recorded on VHS tapes. I traversed four woven layers that investigate the tension between climate chaos and climate resiliency. Techne, the Latin root of technology, the word technology means to fabricate, to weave. Dancing verbal and body-based stories, I wore these technologies, contradictory community weavings, playing with the absurdity and complexity of our consumption-obsessed, waste-oblivious society, I invited audience members to perform with me in front of projected images from my cross-cultural climate justice art book, Zazu Dreams, Between the Scarab and the Dung Beetle, a cautionary fable for the Anthropocene era. We performed reading excerpts as I danced in front of the book's paintings of ocean plastic pollution by Mikaela Amato Amato, my collaborator mother. An animistic response to climate chaos, the dance images play with the ironies of products, in quote, of human intervention and interference in nature, again, in quotes, ranging from yaks to petroleum plastic, Jurassic poop, to basic universal needs such as shelter, both bioregional clothing and creative affordable housing, in contrast to toxic textiles and the ravages of construction industries. So if people are comfortable and willing to 
take off your shoes for the duration of my performance. And also, if you are willing to relinquish your cell phones and even your smartwatches or electronic devices that you're attached to um, and put them on this map uh, on a location where you think that it has a relationship with, either in its production, for example, the mining of the, the mining of, for example, tungsten that makes it vibrate, or um, the electronic waste where it's going to end up when you're done with it. So somewhere on the map, and, and they'll probably end up getting stacked. Then when you go back to your seat, um, I gave pieces of paper if you would write down uh, the location, the geographic location where you put it, and then next to that, where your ancestors are from. In these complexities, it's all horrendously complex and beautifully, exquisitely complex. Can we be in relation to each other asking questions? This is a fiber shed best. Is anyone familiar with the term fiber shed? Fiber shed? So, water shed, like a water shed. The, the um, so local labor, local uh, materials, local, so local production, local consumption. Going back to the supply chain issue, it's a question of bioregionalism and a movement. Right? It's not there's, it's it's not inert. There's, there's, it's about relationality and uh, and intimacy with objects. So what I'm wearing is uh, a variety of sheep, alpaca, goat, um, rabbit, furs, um, and each this is hemp paper, locally made paper, and each tag reads um, what kind of sheep it is, what the, or what kind of animal, and then what kind of breed of sheep, very specific. Um, who the spinners were, so who the farmers were, who the spinners were, who the knitters were. So it creates, again, the story, the object, the story, uh, a sense of intimacy, and a, the connective tissue between what I'm wearing and its origins. How can we live our lives without sacrificing the lives of others? How can we transition from our petroleum pharmaceutical addicted cyber culture to a more bioregional economics rooted in symbiotic relationships? How can we decolonize our bodies and minds by learning from ancestral teachings and from biomimicry lessons from nature? If we embrace how our non-human kin learn, we can develop a healthier, more equitable world through relational storytelling infrastructures. We are all by nature electrical beings, animated by our electromagnetic fields, bioelectrical systems that use electrochemical activity and electrochemical signals. Non-hierarchical electrical communication patterns in nature can be used as models for human interactions as we evolve ecological justice. We inhabit interspecies intimacies, echoing, for example, how trees communicate through intricate underground webs of mycelium. Martin Luther King Jr. declared, one day the absurdity of the almost hum universal human belief in the slavery of other animals will be palpable. We shall then have discovered our souls and become worthier of sharing this planet with them. I'm curious about this palpability. This is what I'm referring to when I mention epigenetics and shifting our evolutionary myceliation, given that evolution is not a trajectory, but ever unfolding rhizomatic interrelationships, like mycelium that travel and tell stories beneath our feet. What if we could evolve our cellular consciousness, our somatic cognition, to shift fundamental relationships that would drive profound infrastructural changes? For example, a cybopath is someone who has the ability to consume food and know everything about the food's history, a kind of supply chain consciousness. Cybo meaning food, and path, meaning knowledge, intuition. Cybopathic capacity represents a cellular knowing of an object's, quote-unquote an object's, in this case food's, supply chain. It's embodied energy, 
life cycle analysis, cradle to grave awareness. For example, if someone bites into a banana, they get a somatic download of how that banana was grown, with or without DDT banned in the U.S., but flagrantly used by North American corporations throughout the global South. The banana eater senses whose bodies were involved in the production and transportation of that banana. Migrant workers, cargo ships powered by coal, the coal miners, the land, of course, on which it was grown in those histories of settler colonialism, and on and on. The imbricated stories of agribusiness and subsistence farming unfold with each bite. Or if someone bites into a hamburger, the story of the cow is revealed. Did the grass-fed cow come from a nearby small farm, or did the industrialized animal object meat come from a massive CAFO, a concentrated animal feeding operation? slaughtered indiscriminately, or perhaps by using Temple Grandin's squeeze machine techniques. I am suggesting that these layers of embodied awareness, as we eat, could influence the possibilities of our individual collective epigenetic potential to evolve as we develop, unveil this kind of somatic cognition, cellular memory, cellular awareness. And I'm asking for others to play with different kinds of worlds like this profound attentiveness and sensitivity that already exist. Like a sommelier who can detect the layers of stories in a sip of wine, what if these awarenesses were part of our genetic makeup, our cellular understanding of the world? Again, referring to epigenetics. Wouldn't we have to make other choices and develop other kinds of infrastructures that support and sustain these choices? The idea that our potential for epigenetic change really is huge. And for us to begin to embrace that, just that possibility, is what I'm, is what I'm suggesting. Uh, the shift, so again, cradle to grave, where we have, like the cybopath, we have an intimate sense in our bodies, simultaneously in our consciousness, of where these objects that we have connections to on a daily basis, where they came from, where they're going, how they were produced, etc. Where are you where from? Are you from? No. no. Where are you really from? And the horrendous uh, politics involved with the production of chocolate, and then of course, what does that mean? Are we in a state of guilt every time we bite into chocolate? Um, or are we making at least a conscious choice to be somewhat coherent consumers and asking questions, even though of course fair trade chocolate, there's endless contortions, right? Nothing is pure. There's, there are endless contradictions. And how do we embrace those contradictions? How do we actually thrive on those contradictions? It doesn't mean that we need to produce chocolate in our, in, our, in our own kitchens, but we need, I'm suggesting, not to be in denial about them. And have, it, have that understanding live in ourselves, live in our bodies, so that we can perhaps create a different kind of relationship to desire. Gratitude as a fit, an understanding of physics, the first law of thermodynamics, right, energy is neither created nor destroyed, but transforming. So what if we could take that on as a political impetus, that understanding of, of energy? Where are you from? <laughs> no. Where are you really Where from? Where are you from? Where are you from? No. Where, where are, are you from? Really? Where are you from? Where are you from? from? Hey, no. man. Where, where are, are you from? from? Where are you really from? Where no. are you from? from? I mean, Really, where are you no, really? Where are you from? from? Where are you from? Where are you from? No, no, where are you from? Really, 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 really,
very quickly slip from taking objects for granted to taking other people for granted. So those who are in sacrifice zones, those who are seen as disposable, Where are you from? No, where are you really from? Where are you from? No, really. No, really. Where are you from? Vast differences, economic, obviously economic differences, uh, urban, rural. I clearly live in a rural environment. Uh, I'm not suggesting by any means that people live in a bus on top of a mountain. <laughs> uh, what I am suggesting is the possibility to ask questions about what we are taking for granted in whatever kind of environment we're living in. How do we work to collectively to get to that side of the room, helping everybody along the way connected? I wanted to see that relationship, and I think that that's the bottom line, is we've got to, and maybe even use it in with our children, you know, in teaching that if we're going to do this, we have to do it collectively. We have to understand that everything is related to everybody else and that we get there only with everybody with us. Children in my fourth grade class in rural Texas searched through my big curly hair looking for horns, assuming that as a Jew I am related to Satan. It must have been that, I have no idea, but that's all I can imagine. The kids in the school cafeteria would go into vomit-mimicking hysterics. They saw my yaprakas and chickpeas as dog biscuits, my colorful clothes and elaborate jewelry as gypsy-like and gaudy. My voice, gestures, opinions were too big, completely out of place. They encountered my Jewish otherness as danger and as a reflection of the abject. My mother and I were clearly displaced, seen as foreigners trespassing on U.S. territory. Where are you from? They would ask, incredulously. And then insist, no, where are you really from? This was my first embodied understanding of the relationship between individual experience and the greater whole, the vulnerability of my quote-unquote ethnic body and the vulnerability of my quote-unquote natural environment, the private and the public, microcosmic interactions reflecting macrocosmic interconnections. I quickly learned both the extraordinary danger and the vitality of difference, the lived intersection between cultural diversity and biodiversity. Where are you where from? Are you from? No, no, where are you where really are you from? from? Where are you from? Where are you from? Hey man, no, where, where are you from? Are you really where from? Where? No, where are you from? Really, where are you from? No, where are you really from? Where are you really from? Where are you from? Where are you from? Where are you really from? Where are you really from? Really, where are you from? No. Where are you from? No. Where are you from? No. Where are you really from? No. Where are you really from? Instead of the underlying racist, xenophobic, ethnocentric, and anti-immigration implications of the question, actually the double question, where are you from? No, where are you really from? Instead of those questions, that question being directed at people who appear different from us, the supposed us, I'm suggesting what a thrill it is that we should be asking, we could be asking, we must be asking, 
this question about the objects in our daily lives, the objects that we take, potentially, that many of us take for granted. When this double question is asked to people, what we're doing is turning these individuals into objects. However, when we ask this question to objects in our daily lives, we are witnessing those very objects as subjects. We're taking on eco-theologian Thomas Berry's challenge. He says, We must say of the universe that it is a communion of subjects, not a collection of objects. And we must be attentive to moving beyond subject-object binaries and remember that the universe is made up of stories, not atoms. What if we could transform one another?